Note that it's important to purchase melatonin from a reputable source, either a physician, either physician or professional grade, to ensure that the label claim matches the potency of the product. So a Canadian study of 31 grocery store um, and drug stores looked at over-the-counter melatonin products and revealed that label claims didn't match up to the actual dosages within a 10% margin. So it, so one could think that they were getting a one milligram dose and end up with a 15 milligram dose, or they could think that they were getting a six milligram dose and end up with a 0 0.01 milligram dose. Um, you know, ultimately there's a very small degree of risk involved in taking a chemically synthesized melatonin supplement. But if in the case of a um, phytomelatonin um, of, from a natural origin, you're going to rule out any um, contamination, um, which were also found in um, these commercially these commercially available products. Um, these, and because it does seem to, it is a um, oftentimes a petroleum based product. So none of those are going to be present in a phytomelatonin. And it's possible that some of the ill effects that people will um, experience from melatonin are related to these potential contaminants. So in terms of phytomelatonin, it's ORAC value or oxygen radical absorbance capacity, um, its ability to scavenge free radicals um, has been shown to be quite high compared to synthetic melatonin. Now, remember when I'm using the term synthetic melatonin, I'm, I'm referring to bioidentical to um, mammalian tissue, um, but it just happens to have a lot of these contaminants. And in many ways, the phytomelatonin um, can also serve as a natural sustained release product as it's going to need to be converted to serotonin and that's going to help it to release um, or have its effects throughout the evening. So in terms of thinking of food as a melatonin source, it's better to think of food um, as an antioxidant source. Yes, it's going, many foods are rich in phytomelatonin, but you would have to consume so much of these foods in order to get 0.3 milligrams, which is about what the human body is going to produce in a 24 hour period. So in order to get 0.3 milligrams of melatonin, one would need to eat approximately 2,800 fresh cherries, 857 cups of walnuts, um, 85 eight ounce glasses of cow's milk, 11 Fuji apples, 15,000 grapes. So you get the picture. A great source of antioxidants, however. So to address the question of what is the best dosage of melatonin, this is a summary of 187 references of melatonin dosing in the research on, on different research uh, papers that came from drugs.com. Um, you can see that all of these doses are on the higher end. Uh, remember that the body produces about 0.3 to 0.6 milligrams of melatonin in a 24 hour period. So um, these higher dosages are going to have greater temperature lowering effects. Um, and that could be a good thing for somebody with night sweats, but it could also um, lower someone's temperature to the point where they're cold at night and it creates agitation while they're sleeping, which is going to interfere with their sleep. And of course, interfere um, with the melatonin being able to provide physiological benefit. So jet lag, uh, dosages used in the literature, one half to two milligrams. Um, pediatric doses have been about two to five milligrams in ADHD and autism spectrum disorder. Insomnia is usually three to five milligrams over about four week period. Um, and you can see that in terms of analgesia, three to five milligrams at bedtime. One of the few times that I will use melatonin during the day in my patients is for an analgesic effect in somebody who's experiencing a lot of pain. And I'll be thinking about melatonin as an alternative to NSAIDs um, or some of the more, um, you know, some medications that have more toxicity. Um, I, I might also give it to a child who's sick who isn't really eating and they just need to do a lot of sleeping and that can help to um, ease them, especially if they're having aches, pains, et cetera. This is an amazing uh, graph that I did not make. I, I borrowed it um, with permission. I want just to share with you 
some of these um, dosages for different conditions um, from a extensive literature review. And you can see that you know, most of the dosing starts in the one, two, three milligram a range and goes up um, you know, for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, diabetes, macular degeneration, multiple sclerosis, cancer. We're looking at these 10 milligram and higher, the quite higher dosages. Um, but you can also start lower. Um, things like hypertension is in the one to five milligram dosage range. Um, bone health, one to five milligram just over time. Um, interesting uh, COVID research using three to six milligrams over a seven to 14 day period. Um, and then cancer dosages tend to be quite high starting in the 10 to 50 milligram range. Thyroid health around three milligrams. And this is all um, the references for that previous slide if you wanna dive a little bit deeper into some of that treatment, dosages and treatment. So ultimately we're wanting to use the lowest dose for the shortest duration. Ideally, we're going to be sleeping in a dark environment, sleeping well and getting that beautiful spike of melatonin in the middle of the night. But since most of us are living in the modern world and there's so much light pollution and there seems to be so much stress and interference with sleep, we really need to know how to use melatonin to our best ability. So, there's two different forms of synthetic melatonin, immediate release and sustained release. So we're gonna be using the immediate release about 30 minutes to two hours before bedtime to um, enable falling asleep. I like to use a spray or a liposomal or something I, um, for that purpose. I don't like to use a capsule. I don't wanna to have to depend upon the gastrointestinal tract to break it down. So if you're looking at an immediate release, you want um, a spray or a um, liposomal product or something that's gonna be um, readily absorbed. Now remember, there's a very short half-life. So melatonin is going to work as a timing function. Um, if you're trying to shift somebody's, well, we're gonna talk about that in the next couple of slides. I'm gonna wait on that, the, the timing function specifically. If you're using sustained release melatonin, it's going to release over a three to six hour period while someone's asleep. And so that's going to help to prevent middle of the night waking. Doses in the 0.3 to 6 milligram range, 0.3 being a really nice um, maintenance dose. I tend to start people in the one to two milligram uh, range, both for immediate relief and sustained relief until we get their sleep normalized, and then I'm going to try to drop them down to as low a uh, dosage as possible. So this is a graph based on a literature review to help you figure out the timing of melatonin doses, uh, dosing for phase advancing and delaying. So on the left in blue, starting around 3 p.m. is the phase advanced zone. So that means that dosing in this range will advance sleep for night owls. So the earlier you dose, the the earlier the sleep onset will begin. The pink zone is the dead zone, which denotes a range in which taking melatonin will not phase shift. Um, and then on this next slide here, this shows you a similar approach using light pulses to phase advance and delay the melatonin rhythm. So you can see that the green zone represents the timing when light pulses provoke the maximum phase delays of the circadian clock. And the blue zone represents when light pulses will phase advance the clock. So what I found alarming about this image um, is how any light at or after the DLMO will both suppress and delay the melatonin peak. So to answer the question, should my patient take melatonin? Is your patient able to avoid light stimulation after that dim light melatonin onset? If the answer is no, how can you best ensure that the patient has the exposure to the melatonin that they need to support a healthy circadian rhythm and all of the physiological processes that it supports? So only a small percentage of research subjects have reported mild side effects. Maybe we would call them an, a melatonin hangover. They seem to be um, most related to those higher dosages, such as fogginess, grogginess, um, daytime sleepiness, dizziness, mild headache. This is the one probably that I see the most 
um, nausea, mild diarrhea, vivid dreams, again, probably related to dosage and less likely seen with a, a phytomelatonin um, and perhaps related to some of those um, chemical, the chemicals that are found in the over-the-counter products that could be contributing to some of those ill effects. It's also been, uh, melatonin's been shown to have a very large safety margin. Um, and in animals, the administration has never been fatal when uh, it's been given orally or subcutaneously. Um, therefore, the LD50 um, has been stated to be infinity. And so that's the, the lethal dose um, is, has been stated to be infinity. So overall, melatonin appears to be a safe medication um, for really all ages when used uh, prudently. So um, the, the big question is always, will supplemental melatonin suppress endogenous production? Well, research has shown that melatonin supplementation does not impact endogenous production. There may be some temporary receptor saturation effect at higher doses where no increased effect can be observed with increased dosages. So in that case, then it's time to um, give the receptors a rest and then go down to some lower dosages for effect. Exogenous melatonin may improve the cell's functioning by removing the reactive oxygen species, thus increasing the cell's ability to produce melatonin. Um, endogenous production has not suppressed, even with 50 milligrams, um, has not been shown to suppress endogenous production. Um, there's no withdrawal effects or rebound insomnia um, when it was discontinued. So um, important to always go over the factors that might decrease melatonin with your patients, the blue light, inadequate um, dimness when the dim light um, melatonin onset starts. Um, alcohol within four to six hours of bedtime is going to interfere with melatonin. Of course, the seasons, um, shorter periods of melatonin production, summer longer in the winter, stress, um, cortisol are going to suppress melatonin, caffeine, even in the AM, best not to have any um, after three o'clock in the afternoon, but some people are so sensitive to it that even morning um, coffee is going to impact their sleep. And these are some medications that have been shown to decrease melatonin levels. Beta blockers <clears throat> have been shown to in inhibit melatonin release and NSAIDs <coughs> have been shown to decrease melatonin level and increase body temperature. So when in doubt, if you're not sure, if you want to give melatonin, we have all these wonderful ways that we can supplement and support the melatonin, the, the serotonin melatonin pathway, as we discussed earlier. Um, and don't forget that exercise is a really important piece of preventing um, or trying to send um, more serotonin to the melatonin pathway um, instead of the kynurenine pathway. <clears throat> 